All right, just to confirm for my listeners, who we got on the phone here, it is the one and only AK-1200. Is it you, sir? <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> I, love, I love the American hey. accent. It's not too often we talk to uh, legends of our scene, and they, and they sound more like me. So it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you, sir. Wow, thank you very much. Pleasure's all mine. <laughs> I appreciate it. And just to confirm for the listeners, like, where are you in the world right now? Where are you in Orlando? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah. Right now, I'm, I'm just north of Orlando. I mean, it's basically Orlando, uh, Florida, down um, in the uh, in the midst of. Actually, we're toward the end of hurricane season now, so um, so far, so good. Yeah, do you have those shutters that you see on the... I've only seen them in TV, but like, do you have those things on your windows that go down to... Protect? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I actually... Uh, I got... My house got demolished um, in 2017 by Hurricane Irma, and um, I've spent pretty much uh, the last year and a half... Like, well, ever since then, I, I spent about a year rebuilding the house, and... Um, now I'm still there's still all the little things that sort of have to just get done one at a time and it's sort of a, a never ending process but um, it, in order to have um, my dogs are barking that's sorry. okay that's okay in order to have um, you know this 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 property it's it's living here you sort of have to you know be prepared for hurricanes all the time strong winds heavy rain it rains all the time you know you gotta wonder like as a person who doesn't live there and i'm sure you laugh at me because i live on an iceberg but i gotta wonder why you live there like even like these tornado valley they call it and it's like why do people live in a place called tornado or hurricane valley like move <laughs> but you know yeah, i mean i it, you pick your poison really i mean for me i i, I was i was born in orlando um and I, it's just, it's sort of like, you know, where you have your roots. So, um, I've, I don't, fortunately I've had a life of, 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 I would call privilege where I, where I've been, a, been fortunate enough to travel and see the world. Um, but it's always good to come back home because Orlando is sort of a, I mean, it's a service industry town. So it's like most people work in, um, hotels or, or, you know theme parks or stuff sure. like that so yeah. it's it's relatively inexpensive to live here and um there's not it's it's not like all hardcore and everything's pretty much upbeat you know what i mean it's not a you know it's not a bad place to live so that's awesome um, that's awesome yeah. and I, I appreciate you sharing that with me um i also admire the fact that you have a house that's in somewhat ruins and you yourself are able to fix it uh before we go further, with the dogs barking, I have to address it. I've got my two dogs beside me. What kind of dogs do you have? Um, one of them is a miniature German Shepherd, and the other one, she is half Jack Russell and half um, Maltese. Hold on, I'm just going to, I'm sorry. No. Hey, babe, can you, you're killing me with this dog. Just sort it out, would you? Right, sorry. No, no, no. I love the candid. I, I, I hope you have. <clears throat> That's not how I normally talk to my wife. It's just she knows that I was doing something too <laughs> busy. Um, and, um, you know, she. Well, no, the, hold on. You brought up a dog breed that I've never heard of miniature German Shepherd. You know, that's what. Okay, in all fairness, I'll, gi I'll give you the story. Um, well, uh, I'll scrape the story. But he was a rescue. And on his papers, it says miniature German Shepherd. When we rescued him, um, he came with another another dog. Um, she was a a Jack Russell. Gotcha. Um, she recently passed, and um, in an effort to sort of, you know, whatever her her dad gave this dog to her, um, this new one, the half Maltese half. Uh, Jack Russell. So, um, <clears throat> but anyway, we've we've always noticed a sort of. It looks like like in him where he's listed as a miniature uh, German Shepherd. Um, you can't help but see her in him. So we think perhaps maybe a German Shepherd went in one night and um, that you know, poor they, thing. 
That poor little yeah. dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, um, Henry Hill was born. And that's his name, Henry Hill, by the way, which I'm a big fan of Goodfellas. So, um, there you go. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you said Henry Hill. I thought of Hank Hill, and I was like, like right? King, King of Hell. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not into my gangster movies like you are. Um, right. You know what? Let me ask you this, okay? We were talking a little bit about your childhood and uh, how you grew up in Orlando. Do you remember what your yeah. favorite childhood cartoon was growing up? Yeah, well, okay. <clears throat> I can go even deeper than that. Okay. 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 My favorite scene is the when <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I don't re recall exactly what it was called, if it was part of duck dodgers in the 25th and a half century or whatever it was but it was it was a skit where bugs bunny would be playing robin hood and daffy duck was the uh he he would he was he was he was he was like an apprentice and um every time he would say dodge dairy uh or dodge duck perry thrust his nose his 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 uh, beak would flap upward so it was it, it was definitely a bugs bunny and um daffy duck thing of robin hood i love the the split the like the actual specificness of the cartoon it's not just bugs bunny and tweety it's this specific episode or, you know, so. i was i was actually thinking about that the other night i don't know why i, I think because maybe i'm an herbalist we'll say that, i was gonna say um, you're probably I smoking little, something <laughs> <laughs> I, I i get a little deep into the into my reflections of which i even dropped the duck dodgers and i think it's 25th and a half 23rd and a half century i don't know you gotta google that but um it's it, it was a thing from Daffy Duck. Well, and to my listeners, right. I implore that you do Google it and find this cartoon. <laughs> um, let me ask you this: since we're still sticking on the childhood and the reminiscence of uh, the past, do you remember what the first album you ever purchased with your own money was? The first album I ever purchased was my own money. Man, and here's the thing: let me let me be, be let me explain. I don't mean it has to be electronic music and on a record. It could be the no, first. No, no, tape no, no. Or... I know exactly what okay, you mean. Cool. Like, like, like growing up because, see, I grew up with with. I had an older brother, and my mother was really, really musical. So, he grew up. He was into at first. He was into like you know the classic rock and stuff like that. My mom was always into jazz and soul and um sort of funk and even like like everything like even like folk music and and like like there would be a a wide array of stuff between like it could be cat stevens or earl klug or roy Ayers, the spinners or chic or wow. um leon redbone it could, it, it, anything and my brother was always and then he went from from like old rock and roll to to like what became new wave um you know like early like the police and and um i would have to say that probably one of the things that i would have gone to to spend my own money on would have been um man I, I just you know I, I I can't even think I would I would venture to say that it would have probably been um, something like a reissue or something that we used to have that got all scratched up like Fleetwood Mac rumors or something like that or <laughs> and hold on, and I want to I want to understand what you're saying. So, you, what is it that you played it so much that you never had to come by the time you were old enough? You went and bought yourself. Well, I mean, your when there were records, yeah. I when I was a kid, I never I never knew how to take care of a record, so we would just like leave it out of its sleeve, and you know, whatever, and they would always get thrashed, and you know, or leave it out. The dog would run on it or something, and you know, I don't know. I, I'm just speculating. Um, well, if Maybe, I could say, uh, hold on, if I could say myself with my records as a kid, my mom used to get mad because I'd sit there by the radio with my peanut butter and jelly and my bowl of cereal, and I would just have all right. her records out, out of the sleeves, on the floor, some on the player, 
and I would just go one song after, and I'd rip the needle off and throw the record down. So I think I could yeah. empathize with what you're you're saying, right? Yeah, I think I think for me early on when I started when I started my actually I would say when I started my independent quest for music as a buyer. Okay, because you got to keep in mind like I used to you know again living growing up in Orlando um like there was always there's two little colleges here there's Rollins College and there's um the University of Central Florida so college radio played a really big part on what was cool and what was sort of where everything was headed you know what I mean like so so um you know when it was when it was sort of rock it was kind of new rock you know what i mean like new sort of like deeper rock like maybe canadian rock you know what i mean like stuff like super tramp or yes or rush or something like that that had more of a, a a deeper meaning or then maybe it was something more like like you know it, it's difficult to explain but but um, anything that wasn't mainstream is is what you sort of always gravitate towards because especially having an older brother because my older brother was always like sort of part of the cool he was like a football player you know what I mean it was like one of the surfing you know, like it's just like you know a, a, you're always on the on the pulse of stuff like that so musically um that's that's where I came from but um I mean I got into I got into you know I'm trying to think of when I crossed over from being into like like that rock and roll to modern rock to 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 new wave to industrial to acid house to house to techno to hardcore breakbeat and and all that um somewhere in there was also a transformation into hip hop where um everything was 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 rap music and it was and, and it wasn't even rap music it was like the whole breakdance scene that was like a really really big part of where where like we we had crews and stuff like breakdance crews here you know what i mean so it wasn't again it wasn't even the hip hop the rap music it was the music itself because you know, um, uh, Malcolm McLaren, his, the his, his the the album, an album of his. He was actually he was the the manager for um, the Sex Pistols, and yet he came out and did this crazy like electronic album that breakdancers broke to, and you know like Mantronics and. Um, you know, just weird early '80s stuff that became um, breakdance stuff. Ice T was doing stuff before he was rapping. That was just instrumental, um, and uh, you know that. So I, I was part of that, and and again, that brings me. I don't mean to talk so much, by the way. Um, I, no, I love it. But You're that saying brings me stuff. into. Um, one of the records I definitely remember buying as a DJ, the first record I bought as a DJ was, um, was by, uh, some people from Miami called Dynamics 2. It's these two guys who I'm actually friends with both of them. Um, but Dynamics 2 and it was, uh, Feel the Bass. And on the other side of the record was Techno Bass. And back then you would be like, wow, man, you know, like, you'd find a record like that and that was straight up for like breakdancing but it's the same kind of record you would find like um Hashim's On the Fish and um and uh Cybertron Clear which is Juan Atkins um from like 1981 you know and and uh, it, it it's just stuff that was um I guess interpreted from Kraftwerk and you know well, no, and I love I love the history of music you're giving, and also your 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 uh, pathway through it. I guess. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this: What was your first experience with a rave? Well, when I turned eighteen, um, 
I, I was introduced to uh, to to the sort of club scene, um, and that's that's how it was. It was just actually it was before I was eighteen. It was because um, we were going to these nights at at, at a, there's a club called Electric Avenue, and we'd go there, and you could be under eighteen and, and go there, and there was places I could sneak into, but. Um, when I was 18, going into my first club, like downtown, it was going through the side door and everything was dark. And then at two, everything's pitch black inside the club and there's a thousand people in the club. And at two o'clock in the morning, all you hear is it's literally black and just little white light strokes. And at two o'clock in the morning, you hear a voice just say, welcome to, to late night. And that was, that was it for me. You'd hear the whole crowd would just, like like was just putty in this guy's hands and and um and it would it would change it would you know the whole night would range from like 128 beats per minute and it would get down to like 100 beats per minute at like five in the morning and just be this really down tempo balearic sort of um really really like people were gurning so hard they were like sitting on the floor indian style with like you know guys and girls next to him and everybody was doing stuff and like it was wild times man like, but that was that was a club called Oz um, and Kimball Collins was the guy DJ and, and um, him and Dave Canalti had this night and, and it was called Oz and it was Friday nights and Saturday nights and um, the first night I went there became you know the first night of being a loyal like I would go on Fridays and Saturdays every week for as long as it lasted. That's well, years, and that's awesome. It, it bred to who you became and who you are today. Um, if I if I read correctly, you started a um, record shop called Hottie Shop, Hottie Spot. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me yeah. where did that begin? Like, what was your mission statement when you guys started that record store? And what's like, how long did it last? And please tell me the, the well, tale. Okay. I guess um, there was only one record store in Orlando. It's called Underground Record Source, and um, there was so many records. There, and there, were, there, you know, there were DJs that were trying to get these tunes, but um, there weren't. There was it was it was geared toward one certain style of, of sort of music, you know, um, and and it was really just sort of housey and garagey. It wasn't like the aggressive. There wasn't a lot of like techno and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, and breakbeat. So, um, you know, I talked to buddy of mine into investing with me and we rented out a space and we ordered a whole bunch of records that we had no business order. In. And, um, and we just, we put a sign on the door and we started the thing called it the hottie shop. We used, we used to call like records that were really, really good. It was 1991. So it's, we used to start, we used to call records that were good. We'd call them hotties. Like, like, oh man, that's a hottie. Like, like, you know, because a, a lot of times you were just white label and, and, you know, promos, people would spend whatever money they had to press, you know, 500 copies and mm -hmm. give it to a distributor back then. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things were really, really, uh, small batch and, and, and unknown. So we, so all the really rare things, you know, we, we call hotties. So I started the, the store and called it hottie shop. And, um, we, you know, we sold records there for, I don't know, a year or two before, um, uh, maybe a year and a half before, like, it was just, I wasn't, I wasn't that, um, I wasn't that devoted to it. Like I would sit there the whole day. We only had two turntables and people would come there and want to listen to records. And I would like do a mix instead as soon as records would come. And I'd, I'd be like, nope, I'm recording a mix. You can't listen to records yet. And I, I didn't care. And, um, that was a stupid thing for me to do as a business person, um, which ultimately uh, my business partner, you know, said, look, this isn't going to work. And he went off on his own and started what became a really, really successful uh, record store in Orlando called uh, Vinyl Frontier. And, um, and that did its thing. But 
also through this shop I cemented a lot of relationships um, from my career um, with drum and bass and early jungle and um, I mean back then it was just breakbeat and hardcore um, but that's how I became uh, so close with like Moving Shadow and Suburban Bass and um, Fotec and uh, Source Direct and you know um, all the different people that I that I got to know so like such yeah. a small thing, such a small risk that you did gave you gave you these stepping stones that to this day are helping you maintain your success in the jungle industry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, back then, um, again, we would get all these all these records, and they would have just either stamps on them, or <clears throat> maybe somebody would do a label, and or they would just write their phone number on it. And I would call all these numbers and be like, "Hey, I'm I'm really really into this record." Do you have anything more like it? I have a record store, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, here, we'll send some stuff. And, and you know, that's how, you know, that's how I, I, I sort of made my way. And ultimately, after that, I started, because I started getting all these records up front, and I was pretty much the only one in America at that time that was, that was getting certain things. Um, I was asked to start reviewing them and, and writing them um, so I started doing that for uh, Mix Mag Update which it was a weekly update um, that was owned by Mix, Mix Mag and I would um, I would write the reviews for it this was um, I think this was like 1992 or something maybe 93 um, and then after that we started US Rave uh, with IC and, and I would you know, write about music there, and then after that, um, like ninety four, ninety five, we started Jungleized uh, with Jeffy, and um, yeah, then that year ninety five, it was definitely ninety five. Maybe it was ninety four, but ninety five, we threw an all drum and bass rave, the first one in Florida for sure, um, and I was the first person to bring. It had Andy C and um, Danny <coughs> Breaks and. Uh, um, wow. uh, I don't even hey, here's the thing. I, people, I, I knew that you were the first guy from America to be brought over to the UK. I didn't know that you were the first guy in America to bring the UKs over here. Like, that's interesting. I, I was the first person to bring Andy C to America. That's that, a that big was, name. That was it. Um, he was 17, <laughs> and, wow. and he couldn't. Uh, we all went to a strip club, and he couldn't get in because um, <laughs> he had to be 18. So I remember vividly him being 17 you know what if I know Andy well enough he's such a sweet man I don't know if he'd even enjoy one of those places he'd probably feel awkward no, in no, place. No, no. you know what and in hindsight none of us really did like we're not it's it's like the creepiest possible thing but it was uh, <laughs> I think it was the novelty of it sure um, sure you know it's like, like bachelor it's, pad kind of like bachelor party it, gotta it, get a stripper right yeah who knows what we were thinking but it was it was really really seedy and and stupid and and okay hold on um, let me uh, off topic let's uh, i want to ask you something because we were just talking about jungle and then you talked about throwing one of the first drum and bass parties and to me that's an interesting topic we have two names for the same genre and it's around that time that from what i've learned is where the second name was born can i ask you when was the first time you heard someone referring jungle music as drum and bass um you know, it was it was definitely after Jungle. Um, I think I think it, it would have been it would have been in reference to either LTJ Bookham or or uh, or something early like. Um, um, Maybe, maybe even. Um, I don't. Here's the thing. I don't it, want to leave it, you. It could have been, go, go ahead. Maybe with um, like something like Creative Source or or uh, or uh, LTJ Bookham's label or um, <clears throat> you know again as 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 somebody who would read reviews or write reviews or get the little promo one sheets with every record that would come 
with every record that used to come, you'd get, um, just like you see in a promo that comes online, it's, there's a little one sheet and it has the description of, of the record, who made it, the, 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 the category, the, you know, the barcode, all that stuff. Um, and in the description, it would say, you know, rolling drums and pounding bass. And you can only say that so many different ways. Um, and after a while, it was just a quicker way to say, okay, well, this one's for the Jungle Crew or this one's for the, for the just drum and bass head. And, and, and it sort of softened what Jungle was because Jungle became more of a specific thing. Like there was definitely the raga element and the, the, the dub element, the Caribbean sort of influence with jungle. It was, it, it became, you know, also, and I, I, you know, I would, I would say that in English culture, um, just the fact that more white people started making this music and going to it, it made it less, urban does that if that makes well, here's sense the thing. okay and, no it makes it, it, and I, don't, I don't mean to cut you off but i want to say something to that and it's that when i started this podcast that was the mission statement it was to try and find out the reason we have two names for one genre and at first i thought i had an answer and then i learned that there's all these opinions but the basic you know common ground is that there were ruffians coming to the party and they wanted to get them out and when i talk to some of the you know black people they'll say bluntly yeah they were trying to get us out of the parties and then when I talk to yeah. some white people, they kind of tippy toe around it. They're like, "Well, you know, kind of." You kind of said it straight <laughs> up, but um, I, off that, I want to I want to say that there is something interesting in what you're saying. That um, we do identify jungle music as the reggae style, and drum and bass is almost everything else. Would you agree? Yeah. I would. I would. I would say that that jungle is jungle is one hundred percent. Uh, inspired and reflected as cultural black music. Well, you can't deny that. There's all of our music is black music. Every bit of music in the world is black music. And and again, bef- like I, well, hold on, hold on. I, I got to call you on that one. You're telling me bluegrass country music? Yeah, it's black. Yeah, everything. Everything. Hold on, hold on. Let me throw music. one more. Let me throw one more. Classical, Mozart. Classical. Okay, the art of of composition may have been created before, um, let's say, before the Europeans met the Africans, right? However, music and and song comes from Africa. People who bang and rocks. No, I, yeah, I agree with you. Like when it comes to making sounds, and then when you listen to tribal music, it's a lot more different. When you talk about long composition music, it is a lot more different than what we listen to today. Exactly. So there's, you there's. You, you're talking about. You're talking about a soundtrack as opposed to a, a to a song. Yeah, I get you on a profound level. I do. Um, the thing is, 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 they're they're spirituals, and that's what that's what became. Um, this music that people were singing had harmony and had melody, melody, and you would hum that, and humming that gave instrumentation to vocals. And you would that it's just it's it it's historically accurate. It's not it's not you know and 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 I know I'm going to go out on a ledge and, and <laughs> probably find some way for somebody, especially nowadays, to to debate what I have to say, but in a sense, all of the bad that's happened in the world that we go back to and that we're constantly in debate over, especially with regard to racism, much of the bad that came with that um, was necessary to provide the good that we do have now music is absolutely a good result of a bad thing i think you're making you know lemonade out of lemons which is is great i love that and i get what you mean that it's risky because you know it's like saying yeah the holocaust happened but how many great songs were written about it right (laughs) 
just like, <laughs> wow. whoa, dude. Uh, so no, yeah, I, I yeah, get what you I, mean. I would, I would, I would take you there. I, 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 <laughs> hold on, I'll, hold on. I will is, throw out, I'm is, Jewish. I can make the joke. So go ahead. There you go. <laughs> I, it, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the rhythm that we had. We wouldn't have the understanding of, of, of rhythms as Americans in in a in song form. Where, where, without spirituals. Well, hold on, okay, then, hold on. If what you're saying, maybe I misunderstood you, because I think what you're saying now is, if it wasn't for slavery, we would have never been able to learn from them. Is that kind of exactly? Like, ah, so 100%. it's not like uh, it was a horrible thing, and we wrote a good song about it. It's that. Well, and I, here's where right. I may disagree with you in that, because where we are today, wouldn't you say there would have been a unification occurring just based on the internet? You didn't need to bring them over on boats. That a hundred years later, they would have ended up connecting via the mail. You know what I mean? Like. <sighs> You can, like I say, you're making lemonade no, no, out of lemons. I'm, what I'm saying is, is what happened in the past happened in the past, regardless of of what we can feel or say or do about sure, it right sure. now. Yeah. Having said that, the things that did come along with that provided a huge wealth of 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 positive for global culture. Well, As I wouldn't say whole. just music. I'd say athletics too. Exactly everything. Every, you look every, at the NBA true. and the NFL. The culinary, and the, every everything. Culinary, yeah, definitely. I was citing, I was citing music as an example of of a of a greater good. You know what I mean? Sure. Musically, that's my forte is music. So for me, if there weren't those songs on the Chain Gang, if there weren't uh, Mississippi Delta Blues. There wasn't going to be rock and roll, and there wasn't going to be, you know, what we have now. Ultimately, we wouldn't be talking about drum and bass or jungle, the diff- and certainly not the difference between it. Um, you know, there's there's ju- there's one thing's a fact: jungle is jungle, and and even though jungle is still drum and bass, jungle precedes drum and bass. So um, it's it's jungle is 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 a is a culture it's a way of it's it's an attitude it's it's the way that you it's a code of that that you've gone through you've you've gone to basically the school of the streets and again this is going to be not popular especially the people in north america but jungle is and was the the london's answer to American street music, to hip hop. And the reason why there's so many MCs that tried to, to, to be hip hop MCs and failed internationally. There were a lot that were successful regionally over there um, and they, they got big, but it was more with dance tempos than it was hip hop tempos. And it wasn't until the grime scene where hip hop or you know sort of started paying attention to English MCs no, you I, know, I agree uh, with you. drum and bass was the only place that that an MC from England could thrive well and even to this day I find that um, if you're an MC who's going to kick bars for the most part don't get me wrong there are your few Few, few in between that do get out there but for the most part they've gone over to the grime or garage scene they're not kicking in jungle they're kicking over there right right so no did you have more to say to that I'm sorry um I don't know I might have I, I'm just free <laughs> freestyling okay man. hold I, on hold on then let me let me move, move I have on no agenda whatsoever perfect that's perfect for this then um let me ask you this. Uh, you're someone who started DJing at a very young age, but you've also been producing for a very long time. So my question to you is this. What inspired you to want to actually start creating music, and how has the stuff that you're using to create that music changed from when you started to where we are today? Okay. Um, I was in the fourth grade, and I started a band with my friends called Del Millipeds, which is Led Zeppelin backwards. And I played guitar, and we had a song called... Suzuki on fire <laughs> and it was it was it was a mimic of kiss god of thunder so i've i've been i've been 
musical my whole life. As I as I said, my mom, mm-hmm. my mom was my mom was a school teacher in an inner city school. She was a physical education teacher. She taught um, Daryl Dawkins, who oh, wow. was a, a a really well known basketball player um, in the NBA, and um, like she 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 got me hooked on music, and she always encouraged me to find. Well, not encouraged me to find a release in music, but but she always let me know it was okay to live a creative life. And so I started, you know, playing instruments from a really, really young age. And I turned that into whatever music I was making or listening to, I would mimic, you know. And um, I, think, I think from then to now is... It, Honestly, I've I've spent more time in 2019 learning more more of my days this year than any other year um, solely focused on music making and and the technical side of music making. Like I've I've done it. I've, I've music's been a part of my whole life. I'm 48 years old, yet I learn more each day than I ever have because there's so much to learn you know what I mean and and I've spent my life knowing how to write music and and record music and play music but the knowing the what frequencies each element best share and the fact that 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 what you're emulating when you're writing a tune is basically it's not the instruments it's the microphones on the instruments a lot of people don't even get that you know, it's, you know, you, your drums aren't, it's not like your kick and, and your snare, it's, it's, and your hats, it's, it's the mics, it's the mics by your kick and the mics by your snare and the mics over your hats or under your hats or beside your hats or the reverb in the room. Like learning all that stuff is something that, you know, if, if, if you've not thought about it, it's, you're going to have to at some point, you know, and a lot of people now, I think, I think, I think it was easier, especially with the whole EDM sort of wave that came in, people learned the technical side of it first before they learned the emotional side of it. Um, whereas for me, I grew up emotionally attached to music. So, it's only now that I'm learning the technical aspect of it. Um, you know, just because of the, the availability of the information now, um, if anything, uh, I'm, I'm able to learn. Whereas um, back then you had to, you know, engineers kept their tricks secret. That's what got them work, you know. No, I totally, I, so. I get what you're saying. There's some perfinity in a lot of what you just said. Um, yeah. <clears throat> actually, before we started talking, I, I believe you were talking about a tutorial and, and, and helping somebody out. Um, the, the thing I got to ask, because I've interviewed over 100 people and not once has somebody started talking to me about a real drum kit when producing. Um, is it safe to say that the music you make is made with real instruments? Like you're not using any synths? No, that's not true. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's not true, but <clears throat> the way that I view them is they might as well be they might as well be instruments. Um, a drum sound because I'm gonna treat it I'm gonna treat my kit. I, I do use drum kits when making loops. If, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, instead of it, instead of scrolling through a beat, I'll load a kit and it'll be an emulator it won't be an actual drum kit that i'm playing but you know i'll I'll maneuver the midi into it and uh swap out the sounds until i find the right sound and i'll move the the you know the the mics far enough from it for it so like you know it's it's all in, in in leveling and and gain staging and um other things I probably shouldn't be talking so much about because again, I'm still just learning as, as I go. And, and, and I'm sure, um, I'm not as qualified to, to really talk about 
all those things as, as other people are. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a DJ and, and I'm a, I'm a guy that, that got lucky really, really early with a lot of good friends in England that, that opened the doors for me to get into drum and bass and jungle and, and be who I am. And, and, um, fortunately I've had a 30 year career out of it and I'm just sort of happy to be here. And now I'm at the point in my career to where I'm, I'm, wanting to be at home more so i want to just make music and that is going to be all kinds of music it's it's always going to be drum and bass but like i, I make a lot of um i make a lot of stuff with with um Eamon downs liquid um he used to be on xl the old school sweet harmony um uh, he and i do a lot of rave revival stuff and like even like new rave i don't even know what you call it but it's like a hundred and 50 beat per minute, 144 beat per minute, hardcore music, you know, and it's it's breakbeat heavy and it's chopped up, just like I just you know everything I fell in love with to begin with about about this music. I'm, I'm tending to find myself full circle and and you know who knows that's but. I've been learning how to how how to do the technical side of this for the last couple of years, just so I can, when it's time for me to stop going out so much, um, I can confidently write whatever I want to write and and be be confident that people um, will at least think that it's comparable to other stuff that that of its sort, you know, or that you've um, made. <clears throat> what's that comparable to other things you've made yeah well I mean <clears throat> hopefully that it sounds at least as as good sonically as um, other things in its in its oh, okay. category gotcha I get you um, you know what I mean I just I don't want to be lo-fi <laughs> you know what I, mean? I can't I wanna, see you thinking that sound I, good. Like, how could you I, AK-1200 wondering if he's going to sound good it's like Andy C. Imagine Andy C. said that to you. Hey, I'm doing a set tonight. I'm worried I might not sound good. And you're like, well, you're Andy C. And he's like, yeah, but it's not jungle. I'm doing techno. It's like, who, who the fuck cares? You're Andy C. You're AK-1200. Well, I mean, <laughs> again, there's, 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 we're artists. We're not, we're, we're not the most confident people. <laughs> it's just, it, half the time, like half the people you know out there that, that everybody puts on a pedestal, we're, 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 well, I, I wouldn't even include myself in that, but half the people out there that you put on a pedestal, they're they're just one conversation away from talking themselves into thinking that this is all one big sham, and they're not. They just got lucky. They just got lucky so many times, and you know it's it's hard to accept um, that it's skill when you're so fortunate compared to other people. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure, but it's a uh, it's skill that you've worked hard and continue to work hard towards to sustain, like you were just talking about, growing every day. Um, I think there's something yeah. also deep in what you said in that it, the reason that you guys are as good as you are is because you are your hardest critics, and you wouldn't be putting out what you're putting out if you were just like, ah, whatever. You know, so... Yeah. It, it, but it is a double-edged sword because, you know, there's a lot of uh, demons in artistry. You see a lot of drugs, rock and roll, sex drugs, and yeah. uh, alcohol... And it comes, I think, hand in hand with that. For somebody who's got the ability to create some of this stuff, it's very dark inside sometimes. Can you empathize with that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, the uncertainty of see the thing that the thing that's even even beyond that. Um, I I mean, fortunately for me, I got through the whole drug dependency or whatever pretty much unscathed like like I would party but I, I, I never got so bad with that that I it became a, a dependency or or something that compromised my ability to function um, normally um, and I got out of it in time for it not to affect me health wise you know what I mean which is another big thing that that um, a lot of people have to worry about but mentally especially when you're when you're in to your career as long as as I've been, um, you you get this continual like this continuous 
um, little voice that, that, that says, you know, you don't want to just fade away. You don't want to just fade away. You got to do something more, um, and go out on your own terms. Like you, you don't want to just be, and then you start thinking of your own mortality. Like, what are people going to say after I die? Like, are they going to, you know, because that's a big thing you see now, like when somebody, you know, does that and, and even that can drive somebody with a, a sort of less than strong sense of mind um, to, to compromise their, their uh, or to question their, their fate, you know, and, and that might in itself lead people to commit suicide. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know, but you know, for, for me, I, I can, I can tell you that, that, well, I could tell you that suicide's never been on the table for me, and I could tell you that um, for me, it's 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 constantly a worry that um, people are gonna forget about me. But I guess um, every day that I think that five minutes later, I remind myself that I've done enough, and it doesn't really matter, and 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 that I am gonna be. It's a weird place to be, man. It's a weird, you know. It's a it's a freaky thing to to think about. But but you you want to have enough, like like. And I know I've already done enough, but I still have a lot more in me, and I, I just want to get it out before something goes wrong. You know what I mean? And and um, but that's not a mental state. Well, I guess that's a hundred percent a mental state because it's you got to be some kind of crazy to be thinking this shit. No, here's here. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What What would you want your legacy to be? So in a hundred years, they're talking about you. What do you want them to be saying? I just want people to 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 unanimously agree that I've given more of myself. That I put the music first. That I didn't. That I don't. I'm not about. I, I, I'm, I've always been a team player. Like I. That's very important to me. That people don't see me as as somebody who's in it for any sort of vanity or or um or notoriety i just i just want to be a solid soldier you know what i mean like like i just like like you would get as a soldier you know i want that 21 gun salute kind of thing because i served my scene does that make sense? Totally, it does. I, I, I'd want the same admiration if I put in the hours you had. Um, I don't think that you need to put in very many, but I'm, I can't wait to hear the rest of the ones you do put in. Um, I got to ask you this because this is the album that I first heard you on. I'm sure others have brought it up to you. Uh, I got to ask, how did the Moonshine Over America uh, set originally occur, and did you know that it was going to blow up to what it's become? <laughs> um. No, no. Uh, actually, what happened? I was on Moonshine, and I had another album to to fill for uh, for my contract um, with Moonshine, and we were doing tours, Moonshine Over America tour, and the last uh, live mix that Moonshine put out was with Carl Cox, and not many p- people were willing to um, to do live live sets you know because of the mistakes and everything like that um so (laughs) we're doing this show in san francisco and uh they get all mic'd up the whole crowd main stage mic'd up you know like and and this is it boom you're gonna go in there you're gonna get on and do it well navi didn't even get to the airport until like an hour before before we went on and he literally just got to the venue um and we talked for maybe like five or ten minutes i didn't even know what order i was going to put the tunes in i just started with a tune and i played and at the very end i just the only reason why i even put drowning at the very end was because i still had time left in my mix um and i had to add something else on the fly but it it was just off the cuff man it was it was literally um uh, it was literally a spontaneous thing um for him and i for navigator and and myself um we you know that i find that you capture a lot more sincerity when it's not not practiced you know what i mean And, and maybe that's lazy of me or maybe that's 
foolish of me, but I, I just, I'm, again, I'm not about myself. I'm about the scene and the music. So I'd rather, I'd rather have that first impression with the crowd than rehearsed. So we just went, boom, one take, bang, done. Amazing. And that was it. Amazing. And stuff. I had no idea if it blew up or not. I, I, I still don't know if it's uh, commercially more successful than any other of mine or, or whatever. But um, I, I know that um, I know that it, 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 it gave Navi and I a lifelong bond for sure. And, um, and, I'm, and there's a lot of good tunes on that that I was fortunate enough to, to get exclusive licensing for. Um, but we paid good back in those days, you know. I mean, we were paying decent money. Well, yeah, and your your track list, and I was never a person to uh, to, to. I was always an MC guy, and uh, right. that was one of the first sets that I loved. Your set, your DJ. Like I think you opened up with an Andy C tune, and I I used to rollerblade around the street like <laughs> as a kid listening to that so much. Um, but okay, so you didn't know it was going to blow up. You say that. You, you think some of your other tunes have got more commercial success? I got, I got a question. What advice do you have then for people, let's say jungle producers, who are looking to gain, if not commercial success, let's say international success? What advice would you have for them, other than working your ass off as much as you have? I would just say, I, I would say it, it depends on what you define um, success by. You know what I mean? Sure. For me, success is a different thing. <laughs> than it is to someone else like like um but having said that i i, I think let's go let's go with recognition then because success like you I, say i might have sold a ten thousand copy go ahead research if, if you did research if you do your due diligence and you learn the history if you take the time to uh, you know i'll give you an example like i go fly a lot right so what am I doing while I'm sitting on an airplane? I might as well be doing something. So I, I buy music books and autobiographies of musicians, even if it's music I don't listen to. I'd like to know their story because we all have something in common, you know, that we chose a certain path. And 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 I think, I think you can never learn enough about what you love. And if you, if if this is what you love, then the sacrifices are vital. You, you know, you have to, you have to, like, like, just because you, you, if you want something, you have to prove that you want it. Like, if you want that recognition, then you seriously have to prove it. You have to sacrifice your time. You have to learn all the things that, that come with it. I'm not saying you have to live in the past, but you have to certainly understand it and respect it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're not going to change the wheel. You know what I mean? You're just going to be a manufacturer, you know, or you're going to be a part, you know what I mean? And, and as long as you understand that, then that's where you can obtain your own identity and uniqueness and individuality as an artist. Once you realize that the, the music itself is bigger than you, you're not going to, you're not going to be, you're not going to change a genre. Nobody is. You know what I mean? You're gonna. It, you might be a flavor, but who wants to be a flavor? You know what I mean? Like, he, like, I don't want to. I'd rather. I'd rather. I'd rather go even pace for thirty years and be hot for five years and forgotten about. Like, it's just that's. You know, you have to have. You have to have, the ability to sacrifice, your time and your energy and your focus to learn about your craft and you have to be you have to master your craft or, or spend your life trying to I'm still not done dude like I said I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> like I literally like like I'm, I'm, I'm watching tutorials every single day like like every day I'm watching tutorials of, of stuff and, um, and 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 at the same time I'm guiding other people I do more stuff in the background than I do in you know, on the front lines, like it, and I'm still very much a student as much as I'm a teacher, you know, and I, and I always will be, and I think that's what it takes. Well, you know what, you dropped some uh, 
deep philosophy in, in the whole, I don't want to be a gear and a mechanism and then talking about accountability and free will and choice. And there's so much that you put into that that I hope people can take away because I agree with almost everything you said. Um, sorry, go ahead if you wanted to add something. No, I was just going to say um, that, that I, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who sort of just rattles off whatever my brain is thinking. And um, these are things that are embedded in me. So they're not for everybody to agree with everything I say, or I, I don't claim to, to, to be the end all of anything. It's just in my experience and in my life and what I've witnessed and how I want to proceed, those are the this is what I know and this is what I try to pass down. Um, like to my kids, even raising my kids, like there's certain ways you go about certain things, you know what I mean? And, and you have to have a fundamental root for things. Like, like every, I was just talking to somebody before I was talking to you. Um, it, it was actually, we, we were talking about mixology and um, cocktails. You can, you can't reinvent an old fashioned, but you can put your interpretation on it, you know, and, and <clears throat> there's craftsmen who, who do these things and you can take craftsmanship all the way back to the, to, to before the dark ages and people, you know, it would generation and generation and generation would, would, would follow that trade. And, um, you know, music and art is a viable trade, just like, you know, it's, it's, you know, but we, it, the thing is, is we don't get, I don't, I don't get a diploma for, for my service. I don't get, a, you know, I don't, I don't have like a football player. I don't get a cushy job announcing after my career's over. You know what I mean? I, I, like, like there's not any, there's no, nowhere to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, Keep working. It's just. Um, it, it really you have it has to be about passion and and you know you have to just learn what it is that is important to you and um, and live by that. I mean that goes for everything. It's not just what you want to do; it's who you want to be. Sure. All right, I got this. Is the final question for you? I said fifteen to twenty minutes. We're almost at an hour, so I really appreciate you taking the time. And the last question is just a. That's my one. pleasure, man. Oh, it, no, no worries. It has been a pleasure. Um, I gotta say, you you obviously being an American uh, are familiar with Mount Rushmore, so I don't have to ask. If we were to create a Mount Rushmore for our jungle industry, or drum and bass, whatever you want to say, which four faces would you put up there? I would put Randall. Mm -hmm. I would put Fabio. I would put Groove Rider. And. Uh, you said his name earlier, and I'll, he belongs on this list based on the three that you've named. Like, there's. Well, you want me to say Andy? No, I was going to say Bookham. Uh, okay. Okay. What, see, I wouldn't even say Bookham. I would say um, before Bookham or Andy, I would say Hype. Really? Well, see, the reason why, and uh, no, you know what? Explain your answer first. I want to tell you why after, but explain to me why you put okay, Hype. Okay, because Hype, before, before all, all of the DJ Hype stuff, Hype was working for Kicking Music. And Hype was, was helping out record labels, and he was doing guest scratching and he was promoting stuff he was promoting other labels before people knew what he was doing you know what I mean sure. and before he got a name for himself and I think I, I mean I, I, I realize many people have done that but hype has a much more um, cemented space than a lot of other people and I think the same thing for like Mickey Finn Mickey Finn has been um Mickey Finn has been a, a, a part of the scene since before it was 140 plus. You know what I mean? If you know, if you have tunes that that were 128, 130 beats per minute, then then you're part of what constitutes the, the foundation. And then if you're gonna have your face on on 
on the scene and there's only four to choose from. <sighs> no, you got yours. You threw hype. I, I, and here's the thing. The reason why I said book him isn't that I would put him over hype. It's just because the names that you put there, to me, were some of the rudiments, some of the godfathers or, or grandfathers of our scene, if you will. And I've been told, I wasn't there to live it. You were, so you can correct me. But I've been told by other people that LTJ Bookham had a lot to do with the progressiveness of the breakbeat getting into the acid house with his rolling bass. He created the first rolling bass that kind of tied the musics together. So I've had people mention that, him. Right, but that would that to me that to me doesn't it it doesn't make him the staple that that Fabio is. Sure. Um, for the very same reason. You know what I mean? Um, just because Bookham was a talented artist and successful label head, um, and still is, but I, I, I just, I mean, look, man, he's one of my favorite DJs, um, and I have nothing bad to say about anybody, but um, I, I don't think, I just, in my personal view, I think there's, there's people who've worked a whole hell of a lot harder in the background to make sure we've had such a stable um, position. Okay, I can respect all that. these years. Sure. No, and I and, and I go, uh, going alongside those other names with that as a, as a reason, I totally agree with you. And when I say that, I mean again, putting the music first ahead of yourself. Okay, that's the key to everything. Sure. Okay, there's there's you know there's. There's a lot of people who deserve a lot of stuff, but they might have, you know, taken their fair share without consent. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, this has to be the last question. Um, <laughs> hey, I think we've had some fun here. Um, yeah. You know what? Let's leave, let's leave it at that. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you, and I want to continue talking to you. So I'm going to sign off to the listeners, but please stay on the phone with me, okay? All right. Thanks, man. I hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, listening as much as I enjoy chatting. That was him, Mr. AK1200. Um, there will be links below, as always. So thanks for tuning in, and until next time, peace out.